Hello, students. <laughs> I'm waving at you, but I don't think you can see me. And hello, TikTok. I'm live streaming this. Can everybody hear me okay? God, my voice is tired from doing the last class. I don't know how teachers do this all day. <laughs> I've been talking for like an hour and a half and I'm already like, oh, what is this vocal fry? I sound like a Kardashian. Okay, hello everybody. My name is, you can call me teacher or teacher. I use they, them pronouns. To those of you watching on TikTok, don't remember that I said that. TikTok doesn't know my real name. Um, I am going to be talking about the Harlem Renaissance today. Um, uh, has anybody heard of the Harlem Renaissance? Are you guys familiar with it? Cool, cool, cool. Um, the, uh, the reason that I know stuff about the Harlem Renaissance, um, is because over the past year and a half, I have been working on a, on writing a, uh, uh, narrative, uh, narrative fiction podcast called Gate City Blues that is set in Atlanta in 1928 and follows a character who was involved with the Harlem Renaissance who came to Atlanta in 1928 to do an anthropological study on the black vaudeville scene. Um, but along the way, she, uh, she becomes haunted by the spirit of her father's lucky card. Her father was a white vaudeville magician. Um, she gets haunted by this lucky card, the Jack of Diamonds, who like gives her magic powers. There's a lot going on, but suffice it to say, I have researched, <laughs> I've researched a lot on the Harlem Renaissance uh, over the past year, uh, in addition to Atlanta history, uh, the history of vaudeville um, and the blues, specifically the Piedmont blues, which is the like subgenre that was popular in Atlanta at the time. So, um, uh, in his autobiography, The Big C, uh, Langston Hughes famously wrote, the ordinary Negroes hadn't heard of the Negro Renaissance, and if they had, it hadn't raised their wages any. Um, so two things. First of all, the Harlem Renaissance was not called the Harlem Renaissance at the time. It was called the Negro Renaissance or the New Negro Movement. Um, secondly, it wasn't really called that either at the time. It was only really a couple decades later um, that that name uh, began to be used. Um, for the most part, people usually don't know that they are in the middle of a social movement while it's happening. Usually, like, the, um, it's not until, like, a decade later that they're like, oh, let's give that a name. Um, but in, in some isolated cases, they called it the New Negro Movement. Um, and the Harlem Renaissance itself is a bit of a misnomer because it's this, like, big explosion of black arts and culture and music and poetry and sculpture and etc. Um, but Renaissance means rebirth. Um, but that was sort of the first birth. So I think it should be called the Naissance instead of the Red Naissance. But that's just me. Um, so why, why did the Harlem Renaissance happen in Harlem? Um, well, first off, uh, are you guys familiar with the term the Great Migration? All right, cool. Um, so during Reconstruction, which is the period uh, immediately following the Civil War, there is a lot of uh, what we uh, call Jim Crow laws in the South, a lot of segregation, a lot of lynchings, a lot of oppression, and this caused a lot of Black people to leave their homes in the South and move up North. Um, this was already going on um, by like the 1890s and a little earlier. Um, but it really picked up speed following World War One, um, in part because uh, since World War One dealt with like European conflict, there was a lot of anti-immigration sentiment. Um, uh, so uh, immigration was like greatly reduced during World War One, and so it created sort of like a labor vacuum. So a lot of folks, a lot of black folks. Uh, moved up north to try to fill that vacuum, except when they got there, employers refused to hire them. And so they ended up in this new city, not being able to make money, um, in some situations worse off than they had been uh, in the South. Um, but uh, there, were a lot of, there were a lot of cities that black folks moved to, you know, Detroit, Chicago, um, but New York and, um, uh, Washington DC, which isn't like technically the North, but um, uh, that 
had a lot of black people because the like the black Harvard called Howard University was in Washington DC and even today they call it, like Chocolate City. It's a lot of black people in DC. Um, but Harlem was like the black mecca. Um, also in the Big C, Langston wrote, "Manhattan takes me, is glad, holds me tightly." Like a vampire sucking my blood from my body, sucking my very breath from my lungs, she holds me. Broadway and its million lights, Harlem and its love nights, its cabarets and casinos, its dark warm bodies, the thundering subways, the arch of the bridges, the mighty rivers hold me. I cannot tell the city how much I love it. I have not enough kisses in my mouth for the avid lips of the city. I become dizzy dancing to the jazz tuned nights ecstasy wearied in the tower days. The fascination of this city is upon me, burning like a fire in the blood." So Harlem was believed to be like a very magical place. It had like a lot of charms and enchantments. It sort of like drew people in. There was a common saying back then um, among black folks, I'd rather be a lamppost in Harlem than governor of Georgia. Um, Harlem was the place to be. However, it was not without its challenges. Um, in 1923, the newspaper, The New York Age reported that many of the ills Harlem is suffering from as a community can be traced to the evil of high rents and overcrowding, which are more acute in this section than anywhere else in the city. Uh, they reported that the average black worker earned $25 per month or roughly uh, 1300 a year and spent from one half to two thirds of these monthly wages on rent. Um, for context, a black school teacher at Atlanta University during this same time period um, made between like around $60 a month. So this was like already less than half. Um, but again, that's like a, a day laborer as opposed to uh, college teacher um but still $25 a month is not a lot um the report also states that black tenants generally paid twice as much for rent as uh white New Yorkers in one case on 145th street colored tenants moved into a five-room apartment paying $80 per month although the former white tenants only paid $40 per month there are still many white families in this house with apartments the same size and just as good who do not pay more than $40 so Making only $25 a month and having $80 rent, uh, the math isn't mathing, as they say. Uh, so um, by 1925, about half of all black households had one or more lodgers in them and about one in five households had one or more relatives other than members of the immediate family. Many residents also employed a hotbed system, which meant that the tenants on uh, different work shifts shared the same mattress which means if you work during the day and sleep at night and someone else works at night but sleeps during the day you would just sleep in the same bed and alternate um which uh frankly sounds terrible uh <laughs> i'll be perfectly honest that sounds really bad but that's how crowded it was <clears throat> and that's how like difficult it was to pay rent um, the reason that rents for black people were so high um, is because it was just legal for landlords to do that. It was allowed. There were no laws against it. Um, uh, greedy landlords played on the fears of white residents and homeowners who tried to maintain the white composition of a particular block. By threatening to rent to black people, these landlords intended to force the sale of properties at inflated prices to wealthy white owners intent on preserving the racial status quo. They weren't necessarily anticipating that what that black people would be able to afford it. They were saying like, you know, I'm going to raise the price of this apartment um, to attract more white people or else I'm going to, if you don't pay these higher prices, I'm going to rent to black people. So white people just left and then black people came in and had to pay those higher prices. Um, and so as black people famously do when faced with hardship, uh, they created uh, an ingenious solution in the form of rent parties. A rent party was a house party in which everybody who attended the party had to pay 25 cents 
um, to get in. And there would also be like a lot of food that they could that they could buy. Like somebody would just make like a whole bunch of food and like sell plates of it at a time, like buy Coca Cola stuff like that. A lot of bootleg liquor, because remember uh, this is during Prohibition, so alcohol was illegal, but it was also a very hot commodity. Um, also in Langston's uh, autobiography, The Big C, he writes. The Saturday night rent parties that I attended were often more amusing than any nightclub in small apartments where God knows who lives because the guests seldom did. This is like just random people off the street. Um, but where the piano would often be augmented by a guitar or an old cornet or somebody with a pair of drums walking in off the street and where awful bootleg whiskey and good fried fish were sold at very low prices and the dancing and singing and impromptu entertaining went on until dawn came in the windows. Even more importantly, he claimed that these parties offered a social outlet for the black working class who were denied access to some of the more glamorous nightclubs and speakeasies in their own neighborhood. At the parties that he regularly frequented, Hughes recalled mingling with Harlem's laborers, including prostitutes, maids, and truck drivers, laundry workers, and shoeshine boys, seamstresses, and porters. Um, so this was very much like a, a, a space outside of like the public public eye where like poor black people could congregate and have a space to themselves because they couldn't afford other forms of entertainment like going to the cabaret or speakeasy. Um, but the rent parties were not without their detractors. Um, Bernice Gore, a Bermuda immigrant, for instance, once said that she thought rent parties were disgraceful because of the corn liquor, gambling, and sexual activity they offered. But when her husband deserted her, leaving Gore, as she stated, with a $60 a month apartment on my hands and no job, I soon learned, like everyone else, to rent my rooms out and throw these Saturday get-togethers. Um, sometimes people would host rent parties every single Saturday. Um, and in order, hold on, 60 divided by 4, that is uh, 15. 15 divided by 4, sorry, 15 times 4. You'd have to have like 60 people at each party for four weeks in a row in order to make that rent. That's a lot of people in one apartment, but it was, they were crowded. Um, and they were, they were like jumping. And a lot, of, um, a lot of black musicians got their start on the rent party circuit. Like if you guys have heard of um, Fats Waller, uh, Fats Waller got his start as a rent party pianist and his, one of his most famous songs was called This Joint Is Jumpin' was like written about a uh, rent party. Um, uh, everyone was welcome at a rent party, but the only provision, according to Thurman, was that the public pay 25 cents admission fee and buy plentifully of the food and drinks offered for sale. But as rent parties became more and more ubiquitous, as well as more profitable, competition arose among organizers who resorted to ambitious but surreptitious advertising strategies. While avoiding too much publicity that might attract the attention of police, who might, uh, as Wallace Thurman pointed out, want to collect a license or else drop in and search for liquor, uh, residents deposited brightly colored cards around Harlem, such as in subway stations, pool halls, cigar stores, and in the lobbies of, in the, in the gates of apartment buildings, elevators. Uh, these tiny advertisements, which were the size of business cards, uh, printed with catchy slogans and listed the name and address of the resident throwing the party. Very similar to how like in a city you might find flyers for for like raves uh, stapled to um, like telephone poles, that sort of thing. Um, and some people have found rent parties so profitable that they became professional givers of house rent parties, getting their whole income from them. And it created like a whole new job of party promoter, um, someone who would arrange for other people to host and they like would organize the entertainment like became a job in and of itself. Um, speaking of detractors of rent parties, uh, are you guys familiar with W.E.B. Du Bois? He wrote a book called The Souls of Black Folk in 1903. Um, he also famously uh, got into some very public beef with Booker T. Washington. Um, uh, Booker T. Washington ran the Tuskegee Institute and he and Du Bois had very different ideas of like black racial uplift. Um, uh, Booker T. Washington focused on like uh, the trades and like um, 
labor like farming and mechanics that sort of stuff like we should teach black people to do trades instead of giving them like liberal arts educations and we don't want we don't want social social integration we don't want to be integrated with white society we want to be separate we just don't want to be oppressed whereas w.e.b du bois was like no we need to like be going to colleges we need to well you know we need to prove that we are respectable and civilized and you know these church going upright citizens so that white people accept us into you know into the greater public um and so he a lot of uh, a lot of du bois's um ideology centers around like respectability politics and like we need to prove to white people that we deserve to be included and that means not making the race look bad by engaging in vice so in the mid-20s du bois owned an apartment building at 606 saint nicholas avenue one of the banes of his existence was a tenant named Mrs. Turner, who frequently held rent parties. Du Bois sought legal action because of the disturbances the guests caused at these functions. He complained, the men urinate out of the windows, and the women sit with their feet out of the front windows. And he just, like, hated this. He thought rent parties were the worst thing ever. He was kind of, like, crotchety old guy at this point. Um, also, at this point, he, uh, he ran the NAACP, which is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. One moment. Um, Wallace Thurman, who I've mentioned before and who I will, will return to, by the way, um, he wrote a lot about rent parties. He, uh, he created a Broadway play that premiered in 1929 that was called Harlem um, and the plot of the play centered around a rent party. Um, but uh, in 1928, he, he described the manner in which black performance was appropriated, uh, adapted, and assimilated by the mainstream via rent parties in an article called Where Jazz Was Born. He posits that the Harlem Rent Party was where everyday black people congregated, and this was the breeding ground for new dance steps and performance routines. At a typical party, he says, one is sure to see what Thurman calls a stereotyped Negro vaudeville performer or a black entertainer who feeds off and explores Harlem's newest artistic creations. Thurman explains that this performer makes it his business to patronize the most colorful of these parties whenever he can, and once there, he becomes a part of the crowd, observing their every action and following as best he can the most original and most striking of their dance steps. The following day, the performer faithfully reproduces what he learned at the party, refines it, and then teaches the finished product to his vaudeville partner. Next in the process, the dance team presents their act on the black vaudeville circuit, where other entertainers imitate the new dance. This continues until finally some white performer on a big vaudeville circuit appropriates what he has seen a less well-known performer do, labels it with a catchy name, and presents it as his own. The cycle completes its course when the dance infiltrates the most stead environments. Thurman explains, in a few more months, scandalized society ladies object to dashing debutantes, so like white teenage girls, disturbing the decorum of their fashionable dances by reproducing refined versions of the mad dance rhythms first seen in a Harlem house rent party. Um, I bring this up because this pattern is very similar to what we see with TikTok dance trends. Um, some black TikTok creator will come up with a dance and then a more famous black TikToker will, uh, will do it and then it'll become a trend within black TikTok and then it catches on with white TikTok and then, you know, we have Addison Rae or whoever the heck, uh, being featured on Jimmy Fallon doing all these dances that black people created without getting any credit. Um, this is like, this is, this is a pattern that we still see to this day. Um, uh, but another thing that I wanted to point out about rent parties before I move on is that rent parties uh, provided a sort of a safe haven for the queer community in Harlem. Uh, Harlem had a very bustling queer community and in the 20s it was very active um, and from tenement buildings to upscale apartment buildings, private parties in Harlem became the safest way for lesbians and gay men to meet, sing, dance, and drink plenty of bootleg alcohol. Because of the dire concern for periodic moral crackdowns by the city and police, the Harlem homosexual subculture, 
particularly a burgeoning lesbian community, developed a flourishing social network. Mabel Hampton, who was a famous black dancer, remarked that lesbians often took rooms next to each other and the girls, as she referred to them, had parties every other night. Um, it may not have surprised many residents of the era to know that there were whole boarding houses full of lesbians um, who lived undisturbed. So it was just like all the lesbians were friends with each other and they rented out all the rooms in an apartment and then just like had parties in each other's houses every night. It sounds like a blast, honestly. Um, but uh, a lot of performers, like not just everyday people, but a lot of the famous black performers during that time um, were queer. Like the vast majority of black female blues singers who were the biggest black celebrities of the era, like the like Doja Cats and Rihanna's of 1920s, um, Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey and Ethel Waters, the vast majority of them were lesbian or bisexual. Um, and like were friends with each other and had parties at each other's houses. Um, uh, in an age when many young artists staged a backlash against Victorian morality, uh, sexual rebellion was another component of modernism. It was another way for young people to be like, this is a new world, you know, we're doing things differently than our parents. Um, even Florence Mills, the most popular African-American performer in the early 1920s, was rumored to have had affairs with women. When asked if Florence Mills was in the life, Mabel Hampton responded, yeah, all of the girls were, every last one of them. Um, they didn't call it gay. I don't know what they called it. I don't know if they called it anything, but all of them was one of those. Um, so this was very like ubiquitous, especially, um, especially in Harlem. There were just a lot of queer people. Um, uh, per more so than any other New York neighborhood, except perhaps Greenwich Village, Harlem provided a degree of tolerance for queer people. There remained throughout the decade the threat of arrest, because remember, like, being gay was a crime. Um, also being trans was a crime, um, particularly in election years. That's when the biggest crackdowns would happen. Um, but in general, there was more leeway from exposure, exposure and censorship in Harlem. Drag balls, speakeasies catering to the drag subculture, and acts featuring pansies um, and bull daggers, which are both slurs, by the way, don't repeat those, were not altogether uncommon. Um, perhaps nowhere else and never before in the United States had sexuality of every variety been so open and accepted as it was in Harlem in the 1920s. You just did what you wanted to do, Richard Bruce Nugent related. He uh, was um, roommates with Wallace Thurman. They were friends, they were both queer men. Uh, Richard Bruce Nugent wanted to be like the black Oscar Wilde and just be like gay and eccentric and weird. Um, he was an icon, honestly, and I love him. Um, nobody was in the closet, there wasn't any closet. The sexual act was public in places and private in others, promiscuous in race and gender, freely talked about and freely practiced. Um, and, um, uh, like I mentioned before, like, um, so many entertainers were queer, but not only that, but like a lot of the literary greats, um, you know, the leading literary, musical, and theatrical figures, uh, like Countee Cullen, Alain Locke, Wallace Thurman, Richard Bruce Nugent, Alberta Hunter, Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, Ethel Waters, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, all of them, um, you know, had engaged in queer relationships at one time or another. Like it's almost like historians talk about how few like leading members of the Harlem Renaissance had children because so few of them were heterosexual. Um, and of course there is definitely a backlash to this. Unsurprisingly, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, you know, believed that if we want white society to accept us, we need to you know, we need to be respectable and civilized. And all these young people, um, you know, all these young people are engaging in vice and it's making us look bad. Um, and so Zora Neale Hurston referred to Du Bois as Dr. Dubious. Uh, they, they famously had uh, a lot of public, public beef. Wallace Thurman and Richard Bruce Nugent and Langston Hughes when they were working together on a magazine called Fire, which I will, I will talk, oops, which I will talk more about later. Um, 
they were intentionally trying to antagonize W.E.B. Du Bois. They were like, how can we, like, okay, let's write about, um, let's write about prostitutes and let's write about gay people and let's try to get this magazine banned uh, by the NAACP. Like, we are actively trying to antagonize the old people, which is just very iconic of them, honestly. Like, they were literally just, like, between, like, 19 and 24, most of them, just, like, early college-aged queer artists living in the same house making weird art um and i love that for them honestly um also hooking up with each other and then getting mad about it and then having very public drama and friend group explosions very universal um (laughs) very uh it's i love that in every time period queer people are very predictable um now, there's a lot of like interrelated personal conflicts that I wanted to go into detail about because I personally think that that is the most interesting part of the Harlem Renaissance is this particular friend group and their weird like drama. Um, and so I want to start with um, uh, this book, Zora and Langston by Yuval Taylor, which is about Zora and Langston's friendship, obviously. Um, this is probably the book out of everything. This is the book I would recommend the most to anybody that wants to learn more. Um, it is excellent. Um, but it starts off talking about how Zora and Langston met each other, um, in 1925 at an award ceremony for Opportunity Magazine. So Opportunity Magazine was, um, the magazine of the National Urban League, which was a black uplift organization, um, the NAACP also had a magazine called The Crisis. Now for most black artists, like if you wanted a short story um, or poem published, you had to send them to one of these black owned magazines. There were very, there were not very many of them. Um, and so their options were limited. And, you know, we know that Du Bois's ideology, you know, impacted which, which art would be selected for you know, the crisis. He only wanted things that would promote racial uplift. He believed that all Negro art should be propaganda for racial uplift. And if there was any Negro art that did not serve as propaganda for racial uplift, it shouldn't exist. There, he actively believed that, you know, Negro art that made us look bad by talking about like queer themes or blues music or cabarets stuff like that he thought it was like actively hurting the movement um so options were limited but zora and langston had each um submitted works to opportunity magazine the previous year um langston had submitted poems and zora had submitted short stories and they both won awards and so they met each other at the um at the award ceremony and unbeknownst to them at the time i believe um they had a friend in common uh, um, Zora had attended Howard University um, and there had been like a literary club in Washington DC hosted by the poet Georgia Douglas Johnson um, and at that literary club she had met um, Richard Bruce Nugent who uh, was just a teenager at the time. There were also literary clubs hosted by a man named Elaine Locke. Elaine Locke was the head of the philosophy department at um, Howard University. He also was a sociology professor and he considered Zora one of his best students and he invited her to like his literary society. Um, But that was earlier in like the early 1920s. Um, Langston Hughes also likely met Richard Bruce Nugent in 1925 um, at one of those literary clubs in Washington DC, but it was after Zora had already left Washington DC. So, like, they both met Richard Bruce Nugent at, like, different times. And then they, like, all converged together in 1925. Um, So this is where Zora and Langston met and, like, their friendship began. Um, Also present at, um, also present at that award ceremony was a man named Carl Van Vechten, who was a famously eccentric, wealthy, white, queer socialite, um who just liked to hang out with black people. Um, like a little bit of a culture vulture, not gonna lie, but he had a lot of black friends and he thought that entitled him to things that it did not entitle him to. But he met Langston there at that award ceremony and instantly bonded with him. Um, and was like, let's go clubbing actually. 
So they left the award ceremony, went to like a cabaret, and then like went to a different cabaret, and then like went to a house party, and then went back to Carl Van Vecten's house, and they just partied all night. And Van Vecten asked him, like, hey, do you have um do you have enough poems to publish in a book? And Langston was like, Yeah, actually I do. Um he was like working as a bus boy, he like not making a lot of money. Um Zora Neale Hurston had arrived in New York with like literally like a dollar to her name and one pair of clothes like they were penniless um and van becton very rich very well connected um was friends with a lot of white owners of publishing companies um and was like okay langston i can get your book published and so uh the next day langston gave him a stack of poems and then he secured a book deal like a week later um and so Langston Hughes's first book of poetry, The Weary Blues, um, was published shortly thereafter by, um, like, Alfred A. Knopf, um, and this was due, like, largely in part, uh, by Carl Van Becken, you can even see, well, this is backwards, but, um, the introduction is by Carl Van Becken, you guys, the screen is small, I don't know why I'm holding this up, um, but um yes so that's important remember carl van becken and that he also became friends with zora zora langston and carl would like go out clubbing together like once a month he was he like was close personal friends with them um i need some water hold on by the way does anybody have any questions real quick before i move on okie doke Um, and I want to talk a bit about Count Cullen also. Count Cullen, um, had a very different upbringing than Langston Hughes. He was considered, like, the poet laureate of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, he, um, he had a very, like, European style of poetry. It was very, like, metered and orderly, very reminiscent of, like, Alfred Lord Tennyson, Edna St. Vincent Millay. He actually, like, wrote his thesis on Edna St. Vincent Millay. He was raised, like, wealthy relatively wealthy upper middle class in the north sort of sheltered his poetry was the kind of poetry w.e.b du bois liked very orderly very european very polite langston hughes pioneered uh blues poetry which you know utilized not only the rhythm of the blues but also some blues lyrics it talked about the kind of people who listened to the blues which you know back then was seen as like very scandalous you know it was very like inherently sort of sexual it was associated with like the criminal like the lower class it was you know like what old people said about rap in the 90s it was that's what that's what like blues and jazz like that's the sort of cultural context it had um and Du Bois was like oh Langston is a poet of the gutter he writes about prostitutes and dock workers and you know, criminals, um, you know, why can't he be more like Count A. Cullen? So, like, nowadays, Langston Hughes is far better remembered than Count A. Cullen, but at the time, Langston Hughes was a little bit looked down upon by, like, the middle-aged black establishment because they thought he was too salacious. Um, Count A. Cullen uh, would later go on to marry... W.E.B. Du Bois's daughter, Yolanda, in a sort of, like, arranged political marriage because his adoptive father was very influential. And W.E.B. Du Bois's daughter, like, wanted to get married. She was in love with, like, a jazz player. And Du Bois was like, that's not allowed. You're going to marry Count A. Cullen. Um, and, like, immediately after marrying her, he, like, left on their honeymoon without her. But with his male best friend, Harold Jackman, who was a model and called by many the handsomest man in New York and generally understood to be Count A. Cullen's lover. Um, Yolanda later joined them in Europe and he was like, look, I'm gay. <laughs> and she's like, okay, I guess. And then they got divorced. Their marriage did not last long. But before that happened, before he got with Harold Jackman, Count A. Cullen tried to seduce Langston Hughes. Um, and he attempted to do so using the poem uh, To a Brown Boy. And I will read that to you. It is also important to note, it did not work. <laughs> Langston was not into it. Uh, to a Brown Boy. 
That brown girl's swagger gives a twitch to beauty like a queen. Lad, never damn your body's itch when loveliness is seen. For there is ample room for bliss in pride in clean brown limbs, and lips know better how to kiss than how to raise white hymns. And when your body's death gives birth to soil for spring to crown, men will not ask if that rare earth was white flesh once or brown. It's like a good poem, but Langston was not particularly impressed. Um, County Cullen was friends with, uh, County Cullen was friends with Elaine Locke, remember, from Howard University. Um, Kante told uh, Elaine, like, hey, um, I, I was not successful in seducing Langston, so what if you try? Um, write to him, he urged Locke, and arrange to meet him. You will like him. I love him. His is such a charming childishness that I feel years older in his presence. Yikes. Um, he described Langston as looking like a virile brown god. Um, Langston teased Locke in his letters. By the way, Locke was still in, um, still in D.C. and Langston was in New York. Langston wanted to attend Howard University, but they hadn't met in person yet. They were only like um, uh, writing letters back and forth. Langston teased Locke in his letters, pretending not to understand Locke's infatuation with Greek ideals of life, which is like coded language for homosexuality, um, asking him if he liked the uh, homosexual poems in the Calamus section of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, then sighing how wonderful it would be to come surprisingly upon one another in some old world street, delightful and too romantic. Meanwhile, he asked Locke if Cullen, he asked Cullen, sorry, if Locke was married, likely just to confirm Locke's homosexuality. But Langston backed off when Locke pressed harder. Their relationship was conducted entirely through the mail. Langston was curious about the professor, but refused to meet him in person. He would later write that he was afraid of learned people in those days. He was like working class and he was sort of intimidated by like intellectual high society types. Um, doubtless the confessional nature of Locke's letters increased his own shyness. Locke was wounded and Cullen let Langston know this. Langston didn't care and pretended not to understand. Locke swore he would have nothing more to do with Langston, only to melt when Cullen encouraged him and Langston approached him. Langston was anxious to attend Howard and knew that Locke could get him a place. But after sending a telegram reading, may I come now, please? Langston backed off two days later with an apology explaining, I had been reading all your letters that day and a sudden desire came over me to come to you then, right then, to stay with you and know you. I need to know you in the biblical sense, I guess. But I'm so stupid sometimes. The next day he sailed for Europe. <laughs> he just left the whole country uh, and soon settled in Paris. Locke was heartbroken, accusing Langston of whoredom writing him, I do not recognize myself in the broken figure that says, come when you can, come soon. I cannot describe what I've been going through. It has felt like death. One day in July, 1924, around noon, Langston was awoken by a gentle knock on his Paris door. It was Locke. 18 months after their correspondence had begun, they finally met in person and they were both charmed. Locke literally followed him to Paris. This is insane. Um... We've been having a jolly time, Langston wrote his friend Harold Jackman, Count Cullen's soulmate. So Harold and Langston were friends. And like, he was friends with Count also, he just didn't want to sleep with him. Um, I like him immensely. Locke took Langston everywhere, the Louvre, the Opera Comique, a ballet, gardens. Um, after spending a few weeks with Langston, Locke wrote Cullen, see Paris and die, meet Langston and be damned. He was deeply in love. He wrote Langston about two days in which Every breath has the soothe of a kiss and every step the thrill of an embrace. I needed one such day and one such night to tell you how much I love you in which to see soul deep and be satisfied. So like, obviously they hooked up. Like, there's no question about that. Um, some historians are still like, well, there's no evidence. Like, okay, whatever. Um, um, but then Langston left for Italy and Locke wrote him a letter that was basically like, I will get you into Howard University and I will even pay for your admission there if you live in my house and essentially like be my sugar baby, pretty much. Like gave an ultimatum, like if you don't put out, I won't get you into Howard. 
And Langston was, like, not okay with that. Um, Locke joined him then in Venice, and, like, they, their relationship was starting to sour. Um, and they planned to sail back to the States together, but Langston was robbed of his passport and all his money on the way to Genoa. And Locke had to abandon him in order to catch the ship to New York. Or so Langston believed. In fact, Locke spent the next few weeks in a tiny town on the seaside, San Remo. He could have asked Langston, who was sleeping in a flop house, roaming the Genoa waterfront, homeless and starving, to join him there. But he didn't, because he was kind of a dick. Um, so Langston came back to New York uh, on his own, uh, met up with Count A. Cullen, um, went to uh, NAACP benefit dance, met Florence Mills, a couple other people, and then met back up with Count A. Cullen. Um, later, Langston wrote elliptically that something happened to him to make him lose my boyish faith in friendship and learn one of the peculiar prices a friend can ask for favors. His biographer surmises that Cullen propositioned Langston, then revealed that he knew about the intimacy Langston had enjoyed with uh, Locke in Europe, um, and Langston was unable to forgive that. Basically, he felt very, like, sort of used and exploited that two people that he thought were his friends were essentially like conspiring behind his back to sleep with him. Um, which understandably is not a cool thing to do to someone. Um, later on, uh, two years later, Langston would write a famous essay called The Negro Artist and the Racial Mountain. And the first paragraph was clearly um, a dig at Count A. Cullen, and so they had sort of like public beef because they were considered like the two rival poets, but like people publicly didn't know about their like history. But when they read this essay, they knew that Langston was referring to Count A. He said, one of the most promising young uh, Negro poets said to me once, I want to be a poet, not a Negro poet. Meaning, I believe, I want to write like a white poet. Meaning subconsciously, I would like to be a white poet. Meaning behind that, I would like to be white. And I was sorry the young man said that, for no great poet has ever been afraid of being himself. And I doubted then that with his desire to run away spiritually from his race, this boy would ever be a great poet. But this is the mountain standing in the way of any true Negro art in America. This urge within the race toward whiteness, the desire to pour racial individuality into the mold of American standardization and to be as little Negro and as much American as possible. So he did not miss words. Um, that was like clearly directed at Count A. Cullen. Um, uh, yeah, there was a lot of drama going on. Um, Wallace Thurman uh, also claimed to have hooked up with Langston Hughes, but Richard Bruce Nugent, who was living with Wallace Thurman at the time, was like, that's a lie, you're, you're BSing, that never happened. Um, Wallace Thurman, uh, married a woman named Louise, Bro uh, Louise Thompson, who he had uh, hired to be his typist for his book, The Black or the Berry. Um, they became friends, they got married, and she left him a couple weeks later because, in her words, he was gay and wouldn't admit it. Um, and she's going to come back again. Um, or Zora and Langston um, were both working together uh, several years later. Uh, were both working together in, like, 1928, 1929 on a play called... Um, uh, Mule Bone, which was based off of a play, uh, based off of a short story that Zora wrote called The Bone of Contention. Um, they were both, uh, they were both being hired by the same patron, Charlotte Osgood Mason. I'll go into more detail on her shortly. Um, and she was very controlling over their, their artistic output. Um, she did not want them collaborating on a play together. And so she hired Louise Thompson um, to be Langston's typist, uh, because Langston had spent years working on poetry, um, that, uh, Charlotte Osgood Mason had been paying him for. Also, she demanded that they call her godmother, by the way, which is creepy, but, um, godmother had also been paying, uh, Zora to collect, uh, folklore research throughout the American South, paying her very little, mind you, but she exerted, like, a lot of control over, both their work and like wouldn't let them show it to anyone else um and it was basically like everything you create during this time personally belongs to me like you can't publish it um it's just mine now um and so she didn't want them working on a play together because she like hadn't sanctioned it 
And so she hires Louise Thompson and to sort of drive a wedge in between them. Louise instantly has a crush on Langston. Langston's not particularly interested. A lot of people say that Langston Hughes was gay. Um, I think that he refused to label himself, um, but he had relationships with both men and women. But for the most part, he was not particularly interested in relationships or sex with people. A lot of people wanted relationships or sex with him, but for the most part, he avoided them and sort of seemed to be happy without it at all. And I think, you know, in this day and age, uh, a lot of people on the ace spectrum might identify with that, but he chose not to label himself, so I will not uh, apply a label to him. Um, Louise Brooks, at any rate, uh, Louise Thompson, sorry, was into Langston, but he was sort of evasive, and it sort of ended up driving a wedge between Zora and Langston. Some people believe that Zora was jealous because she also had a crush on Langston. Some people believe Zora was jealous because she had a crush on Louise Thompson. Um, at any rate, this sort of drove a wedge between them, and it caused Zora to accuse Louise Thompson of, like, essentially having an affair with Langston, because during this time she was still married to Wallace Thurman, though they were separated. It was very difficult to get a divorce back in those days. Um, like, divorce was only legal in, like, a limited number of places, including Nevada. And in order to get a divorce, you'd have to move to Nevada, establish residency for three months, and then get a divorce. So she moved out to Reno, and then a couple weeks later her mom got sick and she had to come back to, to Harlem, so she wasn't able to get a divorce from Wallace Thurman. Um, so Zora accused her of having an affair with Langston, um, like publicly, like this, this was like part of Zora and Langston's big friendship breakup in like 1930-ish, dragged Louise Thompson through the mud, which Wallace Thurman very much resented. So when Wallace Thurman later wrote a book called Infants of the Spring, um, which like satirized their friend group and like basically everybody in their friend group was in the book just with their names changed. He largely omitted Zora's influence on the friend group. He just like left her out of the book. And then when he did mention her, he just absolutely dragged her. Um, uh, so yeah, a lot of petty drama going on. Um, also, it's important to mention that the, um, the wealthy elderly white woman, Charlotte Osgood Mason, who was paying um, Zora and Langston and who essentially had a very exploitative relationship with them Elaine Locke is the one who introduced Langston to her. He was sort of her go-between um, with her and black artists. Uh, he would find like black artists that she could like welcome into her little inner circle. Um, she had a bit of a god complex. I consider like her circle to be kind of like a cult. Um, she believed she had special powers. Um, she had a throne and she made like these black people that she called her children like sit around the throne at her feet um she also like really fetishized native american culture um she believed that american negroes and indigenous people were younger races unspoiled by white civilization whose primitive creativity and spirituality would energize and renew america um and louise thompson says that godmother told her um that she used to see when she was out like in the West doing anthropological research on indigenous people, she used to secretly listen to some of the rituals and ceremonies that no outsiders were supposed to witness. She told me about crawling through the shrubbery and listening to these ancient rites. So like, um, clearly uh, she had no, she felt a lot of entitlement to other people's cultures and believed that, like it was her, like she was the only person who deserved to have access to like, she thought that she had a better handle on, like, black culture than black people did. And so, like, it was up to her to determine, like, which of it was preserved. Um, primitivism um, was one of Mason's passions, and she called it the cure for the ills of civilization. Um, and the other uh, of her passions was controlling the lives of her godchildren. She even went so far as to ask them to record in intimate detail all things financial, domestic, nutritional, and digestive every penny spent, every piece of linen purchased, every calorie consumed, each bodily waste emitted. Um, as uh, Kaplan writes, uh, an author who wrote about her, um, she craved people. She lived for the moments when she could see into someone's soul and divine just how his or her life should be lived. So she was extremely controlling. Um, extremely controlling. Um, 
And, but this sort of patron relationship wasn't particularly uncommon. I think it's important to remember that like during this time where there was this big explosion of black arts, they were not immune to being exploited. They still had very little autonomy. Um, they had to uh, suck up to white publishers to get their books published. They had to suck up to patrons in order to get money to survive. Um, and even people like uh, Carl Van Vechten, who was a friend to Langston and Zora, was not above exploiting them. Um, in 1923, uh, six rather, he wrote a book, uh, the first word of which is a slur that starts with an N. The second word is heaven. I'm going to refer to this book as N heaven or inward heaven, because I don't want you guys thinking that that word is okay to say even in a classroom setting. Um... But it was supposedly a reference to the upper balcony in a vaudeville theater because during segregation, black people were only allowed to sit in the upper balcony. And so they called that the peanut gallery or N-word heaven. Um, subsequently, Harlem was also referred to as N-word heaven because just like the upper balcony in a theater, it was located north of Manhattan. And so he was like, oh, it's a metaphor. But he still just straight up used a slur in the title of his book. Um, the, uh, the novel was an instant bestseller, and within just a few months, it went through nine printings. Um, in addition, the novel's subsequent international success helped make Harlem an obligatory stop for tourists visiting New York City. Its depiction of black life in Harlem had a tremendous impact um, on the way in which images of race were presented, perceived, and discussed in that era. Um, Robert F. Worth surmises that the novel sold more copies than all the books by black writers of the Harlem Renaissance combined. So it's very much talking over his black friends to present like, this is my view of black culture, and it included a lot of negative stereotypes. Um, in brief, the melodramatic plot concerns the tempestuous romance of two young African Americans, Byron Kaysen and Mary Lowe, um, or Mary Love, rather. Naive, beautiful Mary is a librarian and Byron a struggling writer and the two develop a wholesome deep love for one another but soon after he falls for the impetuous and exotic Laska Sartoris um, who's like a, a black femme fatale. A lot of like very negative like hypersexualized stereotypes and it includes a lot of details about going to cabarets in which he like mentions by name. Um, so... The book became sort of like a travel log where white tourists could like go to specific cabarets that he mentioned, like Connie's Inn. Um, and interestingly enough, a lot of black uh, like literary figures praised the book like as a work of literature. Um, some of them were like, it's like a, it's a good book. Others viewed it as betrayal. Um, many Harlemites believed their community had been betrayed and exploited by Van Vechten, who they had treated with hospitality, or at least, you know, quiet tolerance, when he, you know, had, had come slumming in Harlem for years. Um, and Count Ty Cullen, who had been friends with Van Vechten up to that point, um, refused to speak to him for like 14 years because of his use of the slur. He was like, that's not allowed you're not allowed to say that um this was very like presumptuous of you um and w.e.b. Du Bois called the book a blow in the face uh to the black community he says Van Becken is an authority on dives and cabarets but he masses this knowledge without rule or reason and seeks to express all of Harlem's life in its cabarets to him the black cabaret is Harlem around it all his characters gravitate such a theory of Harlem is nonsense. The overwhelming majority of black folk never go to cabarets. The average colored man in Harlem is an everyday laborer attending church, lodge, and movie, and as conservative and as conventional as ordinary working folks everywhere. And so you see, again, his respectability politics, like wanting to affirm, um, you know, most black people are church going and respectable and not, not like this at all. And interestingly enough, a lot of Van Becken's friend group even though nowadays we can clearly see that this book was extremely problematic. Um, 
Langston and Zora and Bruce and Wallace took a sort of like the enemy of my enemy is my friend approach in saying like, oh, well, Du Bois hated it, which means he's on our side. Because remember, for so long, black arts had been limited to respectable racial uplift. And the success of Van Vechten's book proved to Zora and Langston that it was possible to tell a new kind of story that younger audience would appeal to that included stuff about sex and queerness and cabarets and stuff like that because that was the kind of thing they wanted to write about and Van Vechten reaching success you know proved to them that they could and so as a direct response to the critique of Van Vechten's book, they decided to write a literary magazine called Fire with two exclamation points. Um, and that was super influential. I wish I had more time to talk about it. Um, um, but it included a, a, a short story by Wallace Thurman called Cordelia the Crude that was about a prostitute and included a story by Richard Bruce Nugent called Smoke Lilies and Jade, uh, which was about a like queer interracial like bisexual polyamorous triad um and it was the very first work by any black author to be published um that had explicitly queer themes and so uh Bruce Nugent goes down as like one of the only members of that friend group to like publicly like claim queerness in his work and he wrote that when he was only 19. So major trailblazer. It's like written in a very like stream of consciousness style. Um, and that's because his first draft accidentally got set on fire by Zora Neale Hurston's brother the day before the magazine was supposed to go to the print shop. And he had to rewrite the whole thing from memory on a toilet paper roll on the subway. Um, and it like went down in history and so like, just remember that 19 year olds scribbling stream of consciousness uh on toilet paper on the subway can change history um um but uh the 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 magazine had a lot of financial troubles um wallace thurman like borrowed money in order to publish it and then when he was like on his way to give the money to the printer he like got mugged and all the money was stolen and also his clothes um <laughs> So he was in debt for like a long time. Um, and then like all, after it was published, like Du Bois like hated it, which was their goal. You know, it, it was about vice, you know? Um, it was very like avant-garde, um, very modern. Um, but then after, after its initial publication, all the remaining copies of it, ironically, um, caught on fire <laughs> and they were burned. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, big tragedy there. Um, but back on to N-word heaven. Um, it became an integral part of pop culture and it was synonymous with Harlem Entertainment. Like millions and millions of copies were sold. People all over the country were reading it. International people were reading it. They were coming to Harlem specifically to go on to like visit all the places that Van Vechten wrote about. Um, and it it spurred this whole trend of white authors and playwrights making content about, you know, the, about rent parties and black cabarets and showing like the low down life of the, 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 the lower class of black people, which was of course inherently exploitative and full of a lot of stereotypes. Um, um, uh, in March of 1926, a uh, black reporter, Anita Handy, edited a magazine called A Guide to Harlem and Its Amusements. Um, she claimed that Van Becken's book and a play written by um, a, a white playwright uh, called Lulu Bell, which was about like a similar black femme fatale who like, you know, doesn't work. She just sleeps around and she like cons her way into the heart of like a rich white like nobleman. Um, and then is like murdered at the end. She's very much like shown as like a licentious black woman and she was p portrayed by a white woman in blackface. That's important. But the play, the set dressing for the play included posters of local, that referenced local like queer clubs and like drag clubs and like the drag ball and stuff like that. 
And so white queer audiences attending the play were like, oh, there's coded language in here to indicate that Lulu Bell is like cool with queers. And so Lulu Bell became like um, a huge important figure to like the white gay community specifically. Like they named a, they named a gay club uh, after Lulu Bell. Um, and it, you know, she became this symbol of like sexual freedom and, you know, nonchalance and like, I'm going to do what I want. And like the white gay community sort of took her on as like a mascot and tried to emulate her, which started what I believe, you know, is the origin of the pattern that we still see to this day of white gay men, uh, appropriating the mannerisms of black women um using aave getting the you know clacking the loud acrylic nails um saying oh i have an inner black woman blah 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 that's can be traced to 1926 um and in fact um the hamilton lodge drag ball which was like the the biggest like queer event of the year started out as like a black social event like a masquerade ball that had been going on for years and years um and then like the black queer community had transformed it into a drag ball and then it became popular with the white queer community and then the white queer community sort of outnumbered and edged the black queer community out of their own space um which is a thing that happens to black people um all the time um and so Plays, novels, and songs depicted an idealized, exotic, and rather risque view of life among New York's black denizens um, in Harlem, and the images lured white people to encounter the authentic milieu on their own. New nightclubs and speakeasies could not open fast enough to oblige the hordes of white tourists. Um, writers, entertainers, and producers capitalized on the newest vogue and aroused further interest in Harlem's steamier side by continuing to simulate it on stage and in fiction. Practically overnight, these simulations of Harlem through the white gaze became the basis for how the real Harlem would be seen and experienced by white visitors. Concurrently, however, black community leaders argued that the decadence was the result of hundreds of downtown white people who got to Harlem for a moral vacation. And the thing about these shows perpetuating these stereotypes that like, oh, black people are naturally more sexual and savage and barbaric and when you as white people go to Harlem, you too can participate in that barbaric, savage, carefree jungle rhythm was you ended up with a lot of white people going to Harlem and sexually assaulting black people because they were like, oh, well, black people are naturally more sexual. I'm just doing as they do. I'm being more sexually carefree. I'm indulging in taboos, literally taking a moral vacation and like using, you know, this black community as a playground where they could take a break from the rigidity of like white society. Um, James Weldon Johnson wrote, on occasions I have been amazed and amused watching white people dancing to a Negro band in a Harlem cabaret, attempting to throw off the crusts and layers of inhibitions laid on by sophisticated civilization, striving to yield to the feel and experience of abandon, seeking to recapture a taste of primitive joy in life and living, trying to work their way back into that jungle which was the original Garden of Eden, in a word, doing their best to pass for colored. So Harlem became a playground in which whites could indulge their passion to experiment with racial and sexual taboos. And perpetuating the notion that Harlem was an inscrutable grotto with hidden mysteries around every corner, shrewd entrepreneurs capitalized on the desire to explore the further depths of the neighborhood. After all, with insider tips of the party circuit or the right map of the invisible city or a well-informed slumming guide, anyone could permeate the heart of Harlem. In 1926, the New York Age described a service that for $5, not including the cost of drinks and admission to parties and nightclubs, one could see the private side of Harlem that outsiders rarely had a chance to see. It was essentially a safari tour. Um, advertised on small cards with a picture of a glamorous black woman wearing a formal evening gown and a matching hat with a wide brim, the invitation offered, here in the world's greatest city, it would both amuse and also interest you to see the real inside of the new Negro race of Harlem. You have heard it discussed, but there are few who really know. Because the new Negro will be looked upon as a novelty, I am in a position to carry you through Harlem as you would go slumming through Chinatown as well. Which is also bad. 
My guides are honest and have been instructed to give the best of references of being both capable and honest so as to give you a night or day of pleasure. Your season is not completed with thrills until you have visited Harlem through Miss X's representatives. The proposal also noted that two colored guides, one male and one female, would accompany the party. So tourists could enjoy the authentic performances of the rent parties and nightclubs, but they could also experiment themselves with the taboo. This was, to use a contemporary description, environmental theater. Harlem offered the audiences a setting to publicly enact their private fantasies. In many ways, the neighborhood was also viewed as a pornographic playground. For example, in the alluring advertisement just quoted, Miss X is painted as the equivalent of a high-class madam. Having guides of both genders on the tour makes it possible to accommodate a variety of sexual fantasies with the prospect for experimental coupling. And so in this way, like, it's important to recognize that although so much black art was produced um, and it was, the black experience had sort of become commodified and commercialized into a product that, you know, white people could sell so that white audiences could participate in it. You know, these black artistic, um, you know, these black artists had very little autonomy over their work. And like, it was th this, this time period, like Langston Hughes called it, when the Negro was in vogue. Um, and like white audiences used black culture, you know, used their perception of blackness as inherently sexual in order to, um, you know, to slough off the, the rigidity of, of society. Um, but then in the Great Depression in the 1930s, it was like, oh, this isn't a trend anymore. So we're just gonna move on to something else. And so, you know, white publishers stopped publishing black books because it just, if white audiences didn't want it, then they didn't care that black artists still had things to say. Um, and a lot of artists of the Harlem Renaissance died like penniless and alone and completely unknown because they were like completely forgotten about once they were no longer trending. Zora Neale Hurston died and was buried with an unmarked grave. Like she was just completely, and she was like one of the most influential figures. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that there are a lot of patterns within this story that reflect the way mainstream American society and means all you know of mainstream society interacts with black culture to this day um and you know I really want to encourage you to think critically about how you know you consume uh black culture and black music and black dances especially on you know on TikTok there are a lot of there was even like a recent uh TikTok trend about like oh me at 7 a.m and it was someone like oh twerking to like Megan Thee Stallion or something and then it was like me at 9 a.m and it switched to them like you know in a business meeting um and it started off as like an innocent trend but it like when you really think about it it reinforces the idea that like black culture is associated with being um you know sexually liberated and unprofessional and then when it's time to be professional you have to put that away um, whereas for black people, they don't get to put their blackness away, you know, um, they're just universally seen as unprofessional, like to this day, like you can't, you can still be discriminated against just for wearing your hair the way it grows naturally out of your head. You know, you can be fired or get dress coded for that. Um, so yeah, especially because there are a lot of parallels, I think with, uh, what we see on TikTok, uh, like though there is a lot there was a lot of good to come out of the Harlem Renaissance a lot of like really pioneering like art um you know I I definitely think it's important that we we understand and we view that through the lens of like 
these people were still being exploited. Like, even though they were experiencing, like, unprecedented support, like, both financial and social, like, they were still the victims of exploitation and oppression, even in, you know, even in their success. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, an article that I sent to your teacher called The Caucasian Storms Harlem by Rudolf Fischer that I think is uh, really good to read. Uh, I definitely recommend that. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions? We have about uh, 15 minutes. I had planned to have this like a, a sort of Q&A time. Um, does anybody want like want to know about anything else specifically or do you guys have any any questions? Anything you want me to talk more on? Otherwise, I'm just gonna stare at you for 15 minutes. Yeah, it's valid. I, this is, I usually am like not even awake by now. I'm not gonna lie. Um, what's some more beef? Who else tried to sleep with Langston Hughes? So many people, so many people tried to sleep with Langston Hughes. Jessie Fawcett um, worked for the NAACP's magazine, The Crisis, and she was also W.E.B. Du Bois's mistress. She also is rumored to have tried to hook up with Langston Hughes, but was unsuccessful. Um, she was the one who uh, first published his poems. Um, who else tried to sleep with Louise Thompson, definitely. Um, Wallace Thurman, in his book, infants of the spring like dragged so many of his friends like it was it was brutal like he not only dragged Zora Neale Hurston through the mud but like Richard Bruce Nugent he he had some he had some words about Richard Bruce Nugent let me find it I he was he was very influential I personally find Wallace Thurman to be a little bit insufferable it's just like very it's just definitely an example of like being a gay man does not exempt you from misogyny. He like very much viewed women as like decorative, um, did not uh, particularly respect a lot of women or what they had to say. Um, yeah. Uh, where is it? So the character that's based off of, um, the character that's based off of Richard Bruce Nugent is named Paul Arbian. Um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Paul has never recovered from the shock of realizing that no matter how bizarre a personality he may develop, he will still be a Negro, subject to snubs from certain ignorant people. The fact distresses him, although he should ignore both it and the people who might be guilty of such snubs. He sits around helpless, possessed of great talent, doing nothing, wishing he were white, courting the bazaar, anxious to be exploited in the public prints as a notorious character. Being a Negro, he feels that his chances for excessive notoriety, a la Oscar Wilde, are slim, thus the exaggerated poses and extreme mannerisms. Since he can't be white, he will be a most unusual Negro. It's just a symptom of some deep-set disease. Like, what the heck? Um, that's, like, can you imagine being Richard Bruce Nugent and your friend Wallace publishes this book and you open it and you're just like, um, <laughs> excuse me? <laughs> uh, that sucks. Yeah, he had a lot of, he had a lot to say about everybody. Um, he, he talks about Langston Hughes as well. Um, Infants of the Spring is a good read, but I personally find Wallace Thurman yeah I think he's insufferable he just he just is um in terms of book recommendations Zora and Langston definitely is up there um in terms of books that were like actually written during the time period um I definitely recommend Zora Neale Hurston's short stories she was super talented um but also one of my favorites is Passing by Nella Larson um which Wallace Thurman uh totally hated uh he did not like Nella Larson he thought that like oh she only writes about like respectable middle class people she might as well be white you know 
the respectable middle class black people don't have any you know shouldn't be writing because their stories are no different than white stories because to be middle class is essentially to be white like only poor black people should be telling black stories it was it was weird um but passing is excellent it was just turned into a movie that is available on netflix starring tessa thompson and ruth nega uh it was directed by rebecca hall and i definitely recommend that all of you watch it i find that it was a very masterful adaptation of the book uh nella larson was also friends with carl van Vechten. it's just like he just had, yeah, it's, and it's also, like, one of, an example of, like, just having black friends doesn't give you, uh, you know, complete access and right to black culture. Like, he definitely, you know, when people criticized him of using the N-word in the title of his book, he was like, well, I have black friends, like, you know, and they like me, so it must be okay. Like, no, that's not how it works. That's, that's definitely not how it works. Um... Trying to think of more like petty drama because that's what I'm most interested in. Uh, there's also Charlotte Osgood Mason. She was just so weird. She she had like such this like control complex. Um, uh, oh, somebody on my TikTok live. Such this like control complex. Um, uh, oh, somebody on my TikTok live has a question. Since none of y'all have questions, um, they ask, do you see the Roaring Twenties as repeating themselves? I think that's really interesting because a lot of like the carefree, like debauchery party attitude of the Roaring Twenties was a direct response to one, uh, the end of World War One, and two, the aftermath of a global pandemic, uh, the Spanish flu pandemic, uh, which ended in 1919. Um, and so after like going through a lot of collective trauma as a society, Americans were like, screw that, it's time to party. I'm gonna party all my cares away. Um, and I definitely think that over the next few years, like we're already starting to see it, like even though the pandemic clearly is not completely over, there are still people who are very impatient to get back to partying and are putting themselves and others at risk in order to like pretend that everything's fine. Um, you know, I think, but I think a, a large factor of the Roaring Twenties was prohibition um, and alcohol being made illegal that sort of fostered this speakeasy culture. So I don't think that is going to repeat itself, but I think a lot of aspects from the 1920s, I think we're, are, are going to come back around. I hope that answers your question, user lustful desk. All right, we have a couple minutes left, so. <laughs> Any comments? Any opinions? I just... Pardon? Yeah, he was so cool. He was so cool. <laughs> Everyone loved Langston Hughes. Um, Langston, uh, Lang he was just, he, he was just like such a babe. Like everybody thought he was the shit. Pardon my language. Um, and he was just like sort of evasive and elusive. Like everybody wanted a piece of him, but he was just kind of like aloof. Um, there's, uh, in Zora and Langston, they compare him a little bit, like, his arrival in Harlem, they compare it to Bob Dylan's arrival in Greenwich Village, uh, 20 years later. Not 20 years later, 40 years later. Um, uh, which I think there, that's a lot of interesting comparisons. Langston Hughes was just so talented. Um, and, uh, one of the other things I, I recommended, uh, to Miss Colley, um, is a comparison between Walt Whitman's poem, um, I Hear America Singing, and Langston Hughes's response poem called I Too Sing America. Um, um, somebody else on TikTok asked, do you think that rent parties or a modern iteration of them have a future with today's high rents? That's a good question. That's a good question. Maybe that would be 
that would be f hilarious. Um, but uh, I will read you guys, I hear America singing. Um, and Walt Whitman was sort of a pioneer of like this idea of American individualism. Um, and so it's really interesting to see like Langston's response to that ideology from a black perspective. So I hear America singing goes, I hear America singing, the varied carols I hear, those of mechanics, each one singing his as it should be blithe and strong. The carpenter singing his as he measures his plank or beam. The mason singing his as he makes ready for work or leaves off work. The boatman singing what belongs to him in his boat. The deckhand singing on the steamboat deck. The shoemaker singing as he sits on his bench. The hatter singing as he stands. The woodcutter's song. The plowboy's on his way in the morning or at noon intermission or at sundown. The delicious singing of the mother, or of the young wife at work, or of the girl sewing or washing. Each singing what belongs to him or her and to no one else. The day what belongs to the day, at night the party of young fellows, robust, friendly. Singing with open mouths their strong, melodious songs. It's just sort of like this idealistic of the uh, view of the American working class, but um, Langston... Uh, Langston wrote his response to be like, okay, yes, but black people are also part of America. Um, and it goes, I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. And I, uh, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. Um, when I was telling my husband about how everybody wanted to sleep with Langston Hughes, he kind of laughed and he was like, oh, so in I Too Sing America, and he was like, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. It's because he like fully knew he was beautiful and everyone knew it. Um, but yeah, that's my, that's my lesson on the home renaissance. I'm really glad I got to talk to you guys. I, I really hope that this will inspire you to want to learn and research more on your own time. When I was in high school, I barely learned anything about the Harlem Renaissance. So this is leagues more than I was exposed to. Um, so yeah, hopefully you will, you will, you know, learn to appreciate the works of Langston Hughes and Zora and Nella and all them, and you will learn to love them as much as I do. Alrighty, thank you for having me. Alrighty, bye-bye.